Will you join me in praying and before we open God's word together? Father God, we've come together on this beautiful morning and we've sung your praises, we've greeted one another, we've heard your word, we've come to your table. Now we ask you to speak to us through your word. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, the living word made flesh. Amen. So this morning we come to the end of our nine-week series on the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many of you have been with us or tracking along, either watching the, the sermons online or via the app, or maybe you've been here in person for all of them. But it's been fantastic, at least for me, the preparation, the preaching of this series has really helped me grow. I've heard that from other people and many of you as well, and hopefully that continues. Certainly we could spend a lot more than nine weeks probing the depths of who the Holy Spirit is and what he does in our lives. And I hope that you continue to do that even as the series ends and we launch into a new study next week. But we're going to come to a passage which is really the perfect place to wrap this up. And it'll be familiar to most of you. Even if you don't read the Bible that often, I think you'll find some of the words in this text familiar because it's a commonly quoted or referred to passage. It's the perfect place as we wrap up our study of the Holy Spirit. It's the place where the Apostle Paul talks about what we call the fruit of the Spirit. So if you have your own Bible, you can turn to Galatians 5 or follow on the screen as I read. We'll read just a couple of verses to start, sort of the heart of this text, verses 22 through 23. Matter of fact, let's read this together, shall we, in unison? Read with me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things there is no law. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Look at that list for a minute. How many of you, as we read it, or as you're looking at it now, do a little mental evaluation of your own life? It's almost unavoidable, isn't it? Don't you do that? Don't you read it and go, love, nah. Joy, sometimes, like the Cubs won in 14 innings, that was joyful, right? <laughs> Peace, not so much. Patience, my wife says I should work on that. Like you just go pretty good, not so good. You just kind of go down the list and without even thinking about it, you do a, like a little checklist in your mind, don't you, about how you're doing. Or maybe you're the kind of person who's not doing it for yourself, but you're doing a little evaluation of the person sitting next to you. <laughs> this is, let me just tell you, that's not why the Apostle Paul gave us this list. That's not really what it's for. But we, we really do that sort of without even thinking about it. We evaluate ourselves or other people based on this. It's so easy to do. But Paul's not saying, here are nine categories in which to evaluate your life or the life of somebody else. That's not what he's saying. In fact, the word for fruit in Greek is, is, a, is a singular word. It's the word karpos. It's not like English where fruit can be plural or singular depending on how you use it. It's always singular. It's not like fruit and fruits, you know? It's always singular. So Paul's not saying, here are nine fruits, here are nine things. He's saying this is the one thing and nine ways to understand it, nine aspects of it, nine fa- like, like, like holding a diamond up to the light, nine facets of the gem. This is the one thing. This is a description, in other words, not of a, a category of different things, but a description of life in the Spirit, what God wants to do in you by the means of his Holy Spirit. He's giving us a picture of what living by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, actually looks like in your life and in mine. Think about it. Can, can you have one but not the other? Can you be truly loving but not very kind? Does it work like that? Could you be peaceful but terribly impatient? No, not really, right? Could you be a good person but really struggle in gentleness and self-control? No, like, you're, if you're not growing in all of them, you're not growing in any of them. Because these aren't, you can't parse them out. This is a picture of what the Spirit wants to produce in the lives of the men and women who belong to him. Who he dwells in. Now, there's an important distinction we want to make here real quick. If you were with us the last couple of weeks, we talked for two weeks on spiritual gifts from different parts of the New Testament. And maybe some of you took the online gift assessment or you've been thinking about your own spiritual gifts and how to use them. I hope you continue to do that. Gifts are not the same thing as fruit. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, if you trust in Jesus Christ, he does. And if he does, he has given all of us some gifts. But all of us don't have all of the gifts. But when it comes to fruit, that's something that all of God's people, God wants to produce in all of them all of the time. In other words, we live in a culture that celebrates spiritual giftedness. 
sometimes over and above spiritual fruitfulness. And that's a shame. In matter of fact, you could, I could be op- up here operating out of my own spiritual gift of teaching and preaching, and you could think, wow, he's so spiritual. But my spiritual fruit could actually be in the toilet. The mixed metaphors on you. Meaning I could be, go home and act like a total jerk to my family. I mean, sometimes I do, but not, hopefully not as often as I... I'm getting better, right? <laughs> but I'm up here, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the giftedness could mask it. As a matter of fact, if you're using your spiritual gifts and it's not producing in you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, then something's off. So never confuse giftedness with fruitfulness. Let's ask this question then. Why fruit matters? Paul's painting a vivid picture here of what God wants to produce in your life by the Holy Spirit. And as a matter of fact, this really could be described as the character of Christ. Because in Galatians 4, verse 19, Apostle Paul says, I'm in the pains of childbirth. I kind of think, well, how would he know? But anyway, I'm in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Meaning I have this deep ache and longing that you would, the character of Jesus Christ, would be manifest in your life. You'd become like Jesus. You would learn to live as Jesus would live if he were in your place. So when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, it's really a description of the character of Christ in the life of the believer. In fact, why fruit matters? Jesus says in Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and its fruit will be good, or make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad. A tree is known by its fruit. It's a very simple, simple but profound statement. You, you look at a tree, and if it's fruitful, that's a sign of life. But if you're walking in the, in the apple, or how many of you go apple picking in the, in the fall, or have been, ever, or heard of it, right? You, you go apple picking, and, the, and you see these trees, and you look for these trees that are full of apples, right? If you come across one that has no apples on it at all, what is it, what's it a sign of what? It's not life. Something's wrong with that tree. The absence of life. I've got three beautiful blue spruces in my backyard. One's doing great, one's so-so, one is totally brown with no, nothing on it. Now, I'm no horticulturalist, but I'm pretty sure that one's dead. In other words, it's, he's making an obvious statement here. The fruit of the Spirit in our lives is evidence of the presence of the Spirit in our lives. And the glaring lack of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives should give us pause to go, well, what's, what's going on in me? Is the Spirit at work in me? Am I resisting Him somewhere? Fruit on a tree is evidence of life. Can you tell the difference between, how many of you have ever gone up to a bowl of fruit and, and, and you found out it was fake and you thought it was real? Anybody ever have? I, I actually almost took a bite. Usually you pick it up and you know it's like, oh, this is too light. I almost took a bite of a fake pear one time. But I, I have a couple of pieces of fruit here for the illustration. We'll see if you can tell the real thing from the fake. I've got uh, a pear and an apple. One of them is real. One of them is not real. What, can you tell from where you sit which one's fake and which one's real? How many of you think the, the apple is fake? Uh, a couple of you. How many of you think the pear is fake? A few more of you. How did you know? Nope. This was the, I had a green one last hour. It was super sour. This, I stole a sticker from Fresh Market this morning. Not a pear, just a sticker. So, you, so it didn't fool you at all. Right? Last hour, the green one was much better looking. You can't tell unless you get up close, unless you take a bite, right? Taste and see the Lord is good, the psalmist says. In other words, it's not something you fake. Paul's saying, how do you know you belong to Jesus? By doing a few good deeds, by acting a certain way when people are around you, or by the character being produced in your heart and life at the deepest level? That's what he's talking about here. This is why fruit matters. Let me just go through this list and give you A very brief one sentence, like New Testament definition of what each of these aspects are that might be helpful for us. Love, not a feeling. The Bible's definition of love is not how you feel. Uh, Like the great theological band Boston once said, it's more than a feeling. It's seeking the, it's actively seeking the good of others at the expense of yourself. Love is seeking the good of others ahead of yourself. Joy, an increasing delight in God, not just in the things God gives you, but in God himself. Peace, decreasing in anxiety and worry because of your growing trust in God. It's not the absence of conflict. It's the presence of trust in the midst of that conflict. Patience, the ability to endure, even suffer wrongs, 
without falling apart because you know the one who holds you together. Kindness. The genuine desire to demonstrate the love and compassion of God in action to other people. Goodness. Integrity of heart in all circumstances. How do you know somebody's good? Not just in what they do, but in what's in their heart, what motivates them. Faithfulness. An unwavering commitment to God because you're confident that he's faithful to you. Gentleness. Humility. Self-forgetfulness. A quiet spirit. And last, self-control. This is a curious one to me, because these are called the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the self. So why is self-control one of the fruits of the Spirit? Isn't the whole idea that you're controlled by the Spirit, not by yourself? Well, this is really interesting, I think profound. Paul's saying one of the fruits of, parts of the fruit of the Spirit is that the Spirit enables you to control yourself. The Spirit enables you to live according to God's will, not your own. To say yes to what God wants in your life. This brings us to verse, Galatians 5, verse 16, where Paul sort of begins this whole part of his discourse. He says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, self-control is the ability, the God-given ability to walk by the Spirit, not by this thing called the flesh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Simply put, self-control does not come from yourself. Self-control comes from the Spirit of God. Let's ask this question then. How fruit grows? Why it matters, it's a mark that you belong to him. How does it actually grow? Now the fact that Paul uses fruit as a metaphor is really, really important for us and for several reasons. It's very instructive. Why does he use this metaphor? What's he trying to say? One of the things is, when he tells us this, is that fruit does not grow overnight. Do you notice this? Remember that apple picking analogy? You know how long it takes for an apple tree to become mature when you plant an apple seed for the tree to become mature and bear fruit? Seven to ten years before that tree is going to be one you can pick from when you go to the orchard with your family. That means for seven years or more, there's nothing growing there. No apples anyway. And isn't this true in your life? Does it often feel in your life that sometimes spiritual growth is slow going? Sometimes it feels like there's not much happening. Sometimes I wonder if there's anything growing at all. It's, it's happening and it's not visible yet all the time. This is how it happens for most of us. I've been a Christian for over 30 years, learning to follow Jesus for over 30 years. And do you know what the truth is about me? I still struggle with some of the same hang-ups from 25, 30 years ago. They look different. I'm more sophisticated now. But the ego, still there. The desire to have my way, absolutely still there. Sometimes the anger, I wish it wasn't, but it still flares up now and then. Selfishness. How easily my feelings get hurt. How insecure I still am sometimes. It's all still there. Now, this is not to say I haven't grown. I've grown tremendously. But do you ever feel that way? Like, man, why am I not past this by now? You ever felt that way? If you're not nodding in your spirit, then you're not listening or you're lying, right? We're, we all do struggle this way. It's still an issue. Why can't Jesus just bonk me on the head and make me new? Why do I have to go through it? Like, why is it one step forward, two steps back, three steps forward, one step back? This is exactly what Paul's talking about. This is the context in which he gives us the fruit of the Spirit. He's talking about this, this struggle, wrestling of spiritual growth. What he's really doing when he, in this whole passage, which we'll talk about, is gives us sort of two different competing spheres. Or, if you like, if you're a technological person, operating systems. One which he calls the flesh. The flesh operating system. The FOS, if you like. The other he calls the spirit. The SOS. Spirit operating system. Flesh and spirit. And he's talking about the fact that we live right here. If you belong to Jesus... This is where you live, right here the, in, in the intersection of flesh and spirit. We're not here, we're not totally driven by the flesh because we've been redeemed. The spirit lives in us. Neither are we fully formed and transformed, yet are we? We live right there. This is it. This is why we feel this wrestling match and this, why am I not past this yet? And like, why, do, why is this still an issue for me? Now, the word he uses for flesh is the Greek word sarx. Your Bible might say um, sinful nature. 
which is the, the translator's way of interpreting what Paul means by flesh. When he says flesh, the Greek word sarx, he doesn't just mean like skin and bones. He means a spiritual reality, a, a, a sphere of influence, an operating system at work in your heart and in this world. And the Greek word he uses for spirit is what we've already learned. It's pneuma. Now you might remember that the Hebrew word is, is a ruah. Pneuma is a, means the same thing, wind, breath, or spirit. So these are two competing systems. Remember we, we learned, or your Bible says sinful nature. And what we say that the fruit of the Spirit is a, is a description of Christ's nature. The character of Christ in you. Let's read for a minute. Verses 17 through 18. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Did you catch that phrase, to keep you from doing the things you want to do? Did you hear that? Do you see it up there? What is Paul saying there? If you belong to Christ, you have deep down inside a desire to do what he wants you to do, even though you don't always act on it even though sometimes you actually do the opposite. That's one of the evidences of the Spirit, that you, I want to do what he wants me to do, but I just fail. So anybody relate to that? That's this right here, flesh and spirit at war. As a matter of fact, you notice that sometimes in the Bible, this is called the old self. In Romans, Paul refers to it as the, the old man, the old self, and this is called the new self. In Ephesians, Paul says we're to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, when he talks about the flesh, Paul says these things of the flesh are called the works of. Works of the flesh. What does that mean, works of? It means stuff you do. These is, this is called the fruit of, isn't it? What does that mean? The stuff God does. You see the difference? These things are competing inside of us and in the world around us for dominion in our lives. The mark of the Spirit is you desire to do what he wants you to do. And what God wants to do is free you so that you live increasingly that way. Now, again, why does Paul use this metaphor of fruit for a minute? Of growing things. How many of you are gardeners? You like to garden. You have a garden. You had a garden. You've seen a garden. Okay? <laughs> I'm aware that gardens exist, right? Some of you, I love to garden. My wife grows beautiful flowers. She's got them like timed out for the different seasons, what blooms when, and I water them when she tells me, and that's about the extent of it. Now, those of you that like to garden, or whether it's a flower garden or vegetable garden or whatever, does it work like this? Do you buy the seeds for what you want and just kind of throw them down in a patch of dirt and kind of forget about it, come back three months later, and you've got peas and tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and squash all growing in nice, neat rows? Is that how it works? Any gardeners? No. I'm not a gardener, but I know that much. It doesn't work like that. And, I, and because those who are gardeners tell me to go out there and weed. It doesn't work like that. That's not how, you have to pay attention, don't you? You have to cultivate, you have to weed, you have to water, you have to look after those plants. I don't know, I see people out there with their matching gardening gloves and fancy rubber boots whispering to the plants, whatever they do out there, right? <laughs> you, you, the things you have to do. You can't just walk away and forget about it. If you just throw seed down and walk away and forget about it, what will happen? You might get a tomato or two, but you're gonna get a whole bunch of weeds. You're gonna get a whole bunch of weeds and not very much fruit. Now, if you do all those things, if you cultivate and water and plant and, and, and you know, fertilize and all those things, do you make it grow? I mean, we say, I grew these tomatoes in my own garden. I hate tomatoes, by the way. I like, it's weird, this is a weird thing, it's not part of the sermon, but it's funny. Um, my, I like tomato sauce, tomato paste, I like, I like stewed tomatoes and cooked tomatoes. I don't like fresh, raw tomatoes. My grandfather used to eat them like an apple, and the, the stuff would get in his beard and made me sick. And I, ugh. Anyway. What were we talking about? So, right, you, you, if, you, if, you, if you do all the stuff in your garden, and you, you didn't grow it, did you? Not really. I mean, you, you didn't grow it. You don't control the sun, which has something to do with growth. You don't control the germination process. You don't control the photosynthesis, which you learned about in school, right? Like, you didn't make that happen. So all you can really do is try to create an environment in which growth will take place. That's all the gardening really is. 
In Mark chapter 4, Jesus tells the parable of the growing seed. He says, the farmer scatters his seed, sows his seed day and night, and it grows, though he knows not how. I mean, he knows something about it, but still, he's not making it happen. All he's really doing is trying to create the environments, the conditions in which this growth will happen and this fruit will be produced. This is exactly what Paul is saying about our lives. All, we don't do nothing. We don't just sit back waiting for God to make us new, make us loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, like some wa- magic wand. But we don't make it happen. I don't produce fruit in my own life. But I can work on the conditions in which fruit will grow, in which it will happen. Years ago when I was, I was out, this is over a decade ago, I was out in front of my house and I was pruning the trees, this maple tree in our front yard was kind of growing into the, our, our house and my wife wanted me to cut the, some branches. So I was, she's like on the porch going, that one. I'm, like, I'm, I'm like in the tree going, which one? And this guy pulls up in a beat up old pickup truck and he gets out right in front of our house, gets out and walks right up to me. He's like a little old wrinkly guy, bow-legged with big bushy eyebrows and he was like Eastern European accent. I'm not, I know this sounds crazy, but he walks right up to me. I have no idea who he is. It's like a Saturday afternoon. He goes, who, who cut tree? Who, who cut tree? I'm like, I'm holding the saw, dude. I cut the tree. What are you doing? <laughs> I, me, I cut it. And he's like, it's wrong. It's wrong. Come down. I show. I show. I'm like, what? He's like telling me how to cut it at a certain angle, what I'm supposed to do. I'm like, who is this guy? My wife is looking. I'm like, I, I, I don't know. And he, then he goes, who put dirt? You put dirt too close to tree. You hurt tree. And he grabs me by the hand. He's like this tall. And he starts pulling me around my yard. And I, I don't know why to this day I, I just followed him. I'm like, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> We just went around my yard. He's like, these lilac bushes. He's like correcting everything I do in my yard. I don't know who he is at all. And then at the end, like, like half an hour goes by. My wife is like, who? I'm like, I don't know, but I, I have this power over me. And then when he finishes, he's like, 600. For you, I, I do 600. I'm like, oh, get out of here. So like, <laughs> it was a good sales pitch. But he basically was walking me around my yard saying, you got work to do. Pointing out things in my life that he'd be cultivated in my yard, in other words. This is kind of like the role of the Holy Spirit. I don't think he's the Eastern European bushy eyebrowed guy, but he's taking you around your life and saying, you gotta address this. I want you to cultivate this. I want you to create some space here. This needs to be pruned back. You need to dig this out. And, and it's no, this is so many of us approach our spiritual life like we're just throwing the seed down, walk away and think it's just gonna grow magically. We're cultivating the wrong thing right? It's no good praying to God, make me more patient man when I'm cultivating this. If you only come here once a week or twice a month to hear the sermon, if that's it, there's no, and you're not doing anything to cultivate this life, you're, you're kidding yourself if you think you're going to live this spirit-filled life where God's going to make you into the man or woman he wants you to be. It's not magic, friends. He wants to do that, but he invites you into that process to create the conditions in which he can do what only he can do. We'll come back to that. If you just throw the seed down and walk away, you get a lot of weeds, which is precisely what Paul talks about in the next couple of verses. Listen as I read from 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me tell you what Paul's not saying, first of all. He's not saying, you step out of line and do any of these things and you're out. He's talking again, remember, about two images of two different kinds of life, two operating systems, right? One is the spirit. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control is a kind of life God wants for you. And then in verses 19 through 21, he describes another kind of life that's going on in you and all around us. Now, we don't have time to get into all of this, but let me just break it down for you. When Paul says sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, debauchery, Those sounds like those Bible-y words for bad stuff, right? This is all one way of describing basically one thing. Whenever Paul says sexual immorality in the New Testament, he's talking about any expression of sexuality outside of God's intended covenant relationship between a man and a woman in a marriage. Any of it. Now, this is not at all popular in our culture today, but it is what the Bible teaches. 
And he's saying one of the ways you know that you're living over here, this operating system, and not over here, is that you have sexual brokenness in your life. Second thing he says, and notice these, these, these group of words, enmity, strife, rivalries, jealousy, dissensions, divisions, and envy. What's that talking about? Relational brokenness. Isn't that going on all around us? People hating each other, fighting against each other, demonizing each other, dismissing each other, oppressing each other, relational brokenness. One of the other, second way you know that you're living in this operating system and not this one is you have not only sexual brokenness and immorality, but relational brokenness. And then he says idolatry, worshiping the wrong things as God. Just think for a minute, just for a minute. Worshiping the wrong things as God, sexual immorality and relational brokenness. Does that sound like a culture you're familiar with? That's us. That is us. That's the world we live in. It's in our own heart. It's not just out there, in them. It's in us as well. And Paul's painting a picture here. This is who you were. And this is the, the current of the culture is this direction. And of your own sinful heart is this direction. And then God, Paul paints this picture of a different kind of life. Life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what he wants for you and for us. Fruit grows best in an environment cultivated for growth. That's your job. So let's, let's look then lastly at where fruit comes from. Where does it come from? Now, hopefully you'll say by now, well, the Holy Spirit, duh, it's the whole series, right? Yes, but specifically, where in your own life? How does this happen in your own life? In John chapter 15, Jesus is, it's a long discourse, this beautiful passage about vine and branches. And in verse 5 is sort of the central verse of this text. And if you've never read John 15, it's an amazing chapter. Go home and read it this afternoon in your garden if you have one. Jesus says, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a person remains in me, and I in him or her, They'll bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Such a clear statement. I'm the vine. The vine is the source. The vine is life. The vine is what produces fruit. The vine has the nutrients that produce all the things. The branches don't. The branches only have anything to do if they stay connected to the vine. So Jesus says, you must remain, or sometimes the word is abide in me. What does abide or remaining mean? It means this, staying here. Remain in me. And what? You will produce much fruit? No. Bear much fruit. You produce nothing. You produce nothing. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit does that in you. You only bear it. You are just like the display rack for God's goodness on display, right? Your life is meant to be the goodness of God, the fruit of God on display. So how does this happen? I want to read to you three key verses from this passage and put them together because I think they illustrate what Paul's getting at, how this, the secret of how this happens in our lives. Verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 18, but if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Okay, some important concepts here. The main thing I want to say here is this. You and I don't get control over how much of the Spirit we receive. We all receive all of the Spirit. The Spirit is in your life if you trusted Jesus Christ. So you don't control how much of the Spirit you get. You get them all. But here's what you do control. You control how much of you the Spirit gets. How much of your life is turned over and surrendered and how much is held back? That's really the question. That's what cultivation really is. Now, verse 24 is, I think, the central verse here. See it up there? And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is, this is the central verse to apply to where we live. And I don't know I always saw this this way. I think we can slip into thinking that, okay, I got to work hard and by my effort to be more loving, to be more peaceful, to be more patient. Here's the key. You don't become more patient by focusing on patience, right? You think you do. You're irritated with your kids at home and you're you're impatient inside. And so you think, be patient, be patient, be patient. Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. 
Are you being patient? No, you're just not saying the terrible things you want to say. But inside, you're not changed. There's no transformation of character, is there? Right? And you think, good for me, I didn't say it. I thought it, but I didn't say it, right? That's not, that's not a really transformed life. Here's the thing. You get patient and joy and peace, not by focusing on patience, joy, and peace, but by focusing on Christ. It's, it, I know it sounds simple, but it, it's life-changing. When I look to Jesus, all of a sudden I realize, how patient is he with me? 30 years, and I'm still the same egotistical idiot in many ways. I mask it, but I've still got that stuff, and he loves me, and he's patient with me and with you. How dare I be impatient with my children or my wife or this person who I hardly know? When I, when I look to Jesus and I see in him true goodness, like that's, that, you, know, you don't get these things by focusing on them. You get them by focusing on him. And so 524 says, those who belong to Je- Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Now notice uh, verse 18. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. That's a crucial phrase. What does it mean to be under the law? The law s- says it this way. The law says, would basically reinterprets verse 24. The law would say, those who have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, they're the ones who belong to Jesus. But that's not what verse 24 says, is it? No, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta stay with me here. Verse 24 says, those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh. That's what the, verse 24 says. But the law says, that's gospel. But law says, no, 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 you must crucify your flesh and desires, and there God will accept you and you can belong to him. If it read the other way around, there's no hope for any of us. If it read, get your act together. Put to death all that nonsense in your life. Stop being such a loser, and then God will let you belong. We're all in trouble. But that's not what verse 24 says. The gospel is this. If you place your trust in Jesus Christ, you belong to him. Do you remember what I told you weeks and weeks and weeks ago the primary job of the Holy Spirit was? Romans 8. To testify with your spirit that you are a child of God. You belong. You belong. That's covenant language. You belong to him. You belong. You're his. That's the greatest motivation for a fruitful life. It's not, I must be more fruitful, and then God will accept me and I can belong. And notice what it says. If you belong to Jesus, you have crucified. Past tense. It's done. He did it at the cross. You don't live like it. You don't believe it. But that's a different thing. It is done. And then if you go back a couple chapters, Paul says in in, in Galatians 2 verse 20, he says this about this very thing. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a verse that is. In fact, we should put that one up here too. Right there, these two verses to apply to our situation. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Because I've been crucified with him. This is what some pastors and theologians call preaching to yourself. Do you ever preach to yourself? Do you ever, do you ever preach to yourself? Do you ever go, self? <laughs> Look in the mirror and say, self? Open your Bible. No, you don't say that, right? I mean, but, but the, uh, what it means simply is this. Apply the word of God to the place in your life where you need it most. That's preaching to yourself. That's all I'm trying to do to you right now. Apply the word of God where you need it, where I need it. Preach to yourself. Three brief things that you can do to, to do this, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Walking by the Spirit then means what? Continually reordering our desires. Because the current of our culture is this direction, isn't it? it it's, it's going the other way. It's swimming upstream to cultivate this. And this is why you can't do it in, uh, in isolation, why we need each other, why the church is there. Continually reordering our desires to put ourselves back in the new operating system. Second, filtering our thinking, continually filtering your thinking. What informs how you think? You ever thought about this? You, you're, you have a particular view of the world. You think a certain way. What causes that? Well, your upbringing, certainly your background, but right now, like what's, it, what is influencing your thinking on a daily basis? The input, isn't it? Sports talk radio, country music, for me, right? 
uh, social media, your Twitter feed, your Facebook account, your Instagram account, c- cable news. Like that, there's a lot of things going in. You got to filter that. You have to filter that. And some of those things you need to say, no more of this. No more of this. For some of you, you have horrible things going in. You don't talk about it. You don't want me to talk about it. But pornography, all manner of stuff going in. And you're praying, God, make me a better man. But you're cultivating this. How's that going to happen? Filter your thinking. And how do you do that? The Word of God. If you, this, if all, the only Word of God you get is twice a month when I preach it to you. It's not enough. It's not enough. You need more input. Okay, third, last. Continually die to yourself. This is the preaching to yourself part. Dying to yourself. Recognizing in your own life. If you're doing those first two, right? If you're recognizing this desire is not right, this is not what God wants, I'm I'm reordering my desires, I'm filtering my thinking, then when it comes to those things, I can take the word of God and preach it to my heart. Take Galatians 2.20. It's not I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. I've been crucified with him. And the, this life belongs to him. If nothing else, take those two verses, right? And recite them to yourself this week. This, this, is, the life, this is the life of the Spirit. If you want to boil what the Holy Spirit wants down, it's to convince you in your heart that you belong to Jesus Christ, not to the world. And to increasingly ca- call you to surrender so that you live over here in the new operating system called the Spirit. I mean, we're all right here in some way, right? But God is pulling us and calling us, moving us by his spirit to be loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, faithful, good, and gentle, and self-controlled men and women. And last, this is, I promise, I said last like 10 times. This is the last, last. What do you think our world desperately needs? I mean, we, I read articles constantly about the church losing its influence, Christianity becoming irrelevant, the people debating whether the, the Christian church is a good thing for society, and all this stuff going on and on. What, what's the best way to combat that? I'll tell you what it is. More angry Facebook posts. That's what the world needs. <laughs> you know what it needs? No, what it desperately needs is for me and for you and for us to live this way. The best apologetic it's for a whole bunch of people who claim Jesus' name to be that kind of people. To surrender my whole life so God can do what only God can do. Let's stand together for closing prayer. And I'll, I'll pray and then give the benediction. And by the way, I, uh, if you would like someone to pray for you in the glass room, we'll meet with you at the close of the service. And those of you who came prepared to give the benevolent offering, ushers receive that to bless those that are in need as you leave. Let's, let me pray. Father God, you've you've given us your son who died in our place and redeemed our lives, paying for our sin, liberating us from the bondage of sin and death. You've given us your spirit to seal us as belonging to you, to dwell in our hearts. And you want to transform us into the character of your son, Jesus. Forgive us for resisting that. Help us by your spirit to live according to your spirit, to walk in step with your spirit, that we might indeed become Women and men, marked by the character of Christ, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We praise you that against these things there is no law. We love you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Go in peace.